Hello everyone and thank you for taking the time to listen to this lecture on the law as a social as a determinant of black health. My name is Vanilla Randall. As you can see, I'm a professor of law at the University of Dayton School of Law. And this is one a lecture in a series that we will be conducting uh, all year on black health and the role of the law in maintaining or eliminating health disparities. Uh, if you have not done so, it would be helpful to you if you review the video on black health status and if you review this video on racial inequality, the lecture done by Dr. Kathy Sander Phillips, because those two videos lay the foundation for the arguments in, uh, in this video. To start off with, though, I, we need to um, understand the disparity in health status and how it came about and why social determinants are a central part. And hopefully this uh, schema will give this some understanding. Okay, so we start off with Africans being taken as slaves and brought to this country. And that's a very important point in our discussion about the health of Black Americans and the slave health deficit that exists. It's an important point because we have to acknowledge that Africans did not arrive at this country healthy as a group. And in fact, exactly the opposite occurred. They arrived unhealthy, and uh, which is essentially why Africans were taken enslaved Africans were taken to the Caribbean before being brought to the United States because you cannot uh, put unhealthy uh, product on the market and expect it to fetch a good price. And it shouldn't be of no surprise to us that uh, people of African descent, black enslaved Africans were unhealthy. Uh, not only did they undergo the stress of being enslaved in their on their homeland, ripped from their family, uh, being kept in um, forts that were built to hold gold but are now holding slaves, uh, enslaved people, not only did they undergo the stress of that, they under uh, they had to undergo the voyage, uh, the transatlantic slave voyage, in which half of the enslaved, the Africans who were captured died on the voyage. They had to undergo sleeping in the urine and fetus and in the dead decaying bodies of, of enslaved people. They had, uh, uh, they had to undergo being packed so tight that there was no room to move and all of the disease that went along with that. I know that among my community, the, Af the people of African descent in, in the United States, uh, we often talk about how we have, quote, strong genes because we survived the voyage. Not with, there's a whole mythology that is connected with that saying, but to the, we have to understand that surviving didn't mean healthy. So we stepped, our ancestors stepped off of those slave ships sick. And unlike any other group, except maybe the Irish, who also were, although they weren't enslaved, they, uh, and so they didn't have to undergo the, the problem of slavery and being enslaved. The, the poorest of the Irish came here 
packed in the bottom of cruise ships. But that's a discussion for another time. What we have here is people of African descent. Our ancestors came, arrived to the Caribbean and stepped off sick. Okay. The ones who didn't die from disease and illness are drowning, being thrown overboard, stepped off of the the slave ships barely surviving so our entry into this country not only uh, was one of illness that was perpetuated throughout slavery and uh there there are studies done comparing the, the health of slaves to the health of uh, of indentured servants to the health of poor whites and repeatedly uh, descend slaves, enslaved people had poor health. Now, you would think that coming out of, of uh, slavery, that one of the things that the United States would do is provide reparations in the at least in the form of bringing people's health status back up to a norm and while there was a recognition uh, of the need for more health facilities uh, and uh, for people of African descent for formerly enslaved persons the effort to improve the health status and the educational status legally only went on for a year. The Freedom Bureau, which was enacted to do that, was um, the, the Congress voted it out a year later. Notwithstanding that, formerly enslaved people, freemen, made significant strides in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And part of that was the reason we saw the enactment of legal apartheid and de facto apartheid in the North. So what we saw was that people of African descent during the 20th century was mostly uh, functioning under apartheid. And where apartheid didn't exist, racism exists. And those stressors led to deprivations and oppression, which embedded into our society racial inequalities. Racial inequalities in wealth and income, racial inequalities in education, racial inequality in criminal justice system, racial inequality in an environment, racial inequality in health care, racial inequality in housing, racial inequality in the marketing and the targeting of drugs, guns, alcohol, and tobacco, racial inequality in employment, racial inequality in food and water, racial inequality in every determinant of health. Those embedded racial inequalities affected not only the individuals, but the communities in which they lived and in which we lived. And so when we talk about uh, individual behavior and choices affecting health, and it does, when I choose not to exercise, that affects my health. When I choose not to eat fresh vegetables and food, that affects my health. But those choices are not made free of the social and racial inequalities that exist. As Professor Sanders Phillips discussed, Racial inequalities is a risk factor for African-American communities. 
Not only that, the chronic stress of racism affects the health. Separate and independent from the racial inequalities that are embedded in our society, there is the chronic stress of racism that is not being borne by the white community. That chronic stress of racism affects the health of individuals, which affects the communities they live in. The more unhealthy your community is, the less resources your community has to deal with the problems. So how does law come into play? Well, what we, what we know is that there are few, if any, factors in social, economic, environmental, political factors that are not affected by the legal system. Uh, it is inevitable that the law or the legal system, and I, and I prefer the legal system here than the law because law can have a very narrow uh, definition and we're talking about not just a rule of law, but the entire legal system impacts some role in any effort to change society or to maintain society. If there is problems affecting change, one way, one thing to think about and to ask is how is the legal system functioning to prevent change from happening? The legal system affects institutional behavior it affects how community behaves, it affects how individual behave, and all of that affects health. So what I want to do for a few minutes is to take a look at the legal system and to make sure that we all have the same basic understanding. And I know that many Americans have this understanding, but many don't. And we have many people who are not Americans looking at this uh, video. So when we talk about the law, one of the things to think about is that the law is a set of rules and guidelines enforced through a set of practices and institutions, and that one of those institutions is the legal system. One of the things I tell my students all the time is that think of the law as the minimum set of values that a society believes it needs in order to function smoothly for the members of its society. The law is a value system. <clears throat> what is enforced, what rules are made, all represent a value. And where one value is represented, an opposite value could be represented. One of the purposes of the law is to limit and authorize conduct in society. And so what we see through tort law, through criminal law, through contract law, through discrimination law, we see all of these areas of law have the same basic approach. They limit and they authorize conduct. They may work on the corporate level or the organizational level or the individual level. And what's important here is that if the law doesn't limit conduct, then it authorizes it. 
And so to the extent that the law is silent on something, completely silent, then it's, it is authorized. The other area that the law does, uh, where we use the law, is to set priority goals for our society. And we throw that, we do that through our funding initiatives. So when we fund military, we fund proportionately more money for military than health and human services. It is because our priority is military. When we have more, proportionally more money going into prisons than we do into schools, it is because our priority uh, for the society is in, imprisoning people rather than educating people. When we talk of the law, it's important there are several sources of the law beyond the Constitution and the statute. And of course, those are important sources of the law. In fact, the U.S. Constitution is the basic source of all law. Anything, any enacted law has to be constitutional under the federal constitution and under the state constitutions. The 10th Amendment of the uh, United States Constitution basically provides that the federal government is only granted power, only has the power that is granted by the Constitution. And specifically that the state, that all powers not granted to the federal government go to the state. Now having said that, there are some very broad powers granted to the federal government. The Commerce Clause, the uh, the right to make treaties, uh, the um, health and safety are, are all things that are granted to the United States government. Statutes are written by the legislature, signed by the president, governor, or appropriate city official, and they represent a general policy framework State, federal laws are seen to be the minimum, and, and so state laws can go beyond a federal law so long as there is no conflict. We don't often think of regulations as law, but they are. Legislatures, most laws cannot implement every rule needed to uh, cannot state every rule needed to implement a law. And so legislatures will delegate the power to administrative agency to make rules, regulations, and guidelines. The rules and regulation add details and specifics to the law that, is, uh, that are not in the law. And the guidelines are issued to add clarification to the law. And generally, they have the force of law. That is, unless the Supreme, the courts ruled them unconstitution, unconstitutional, you, uh, we are, as members of the society, are required to obey regulations in the same way we are required to obey statutes. Cases are the published, uh, published opinions of judges that interpret uh, statutes, regulations, and constitutional provisions. They also interpret behavior under common law. So one of the things that you uh, hear off said often is, is that judges don't make law, but that's not entirely true because judges make common law. And the legal system depends on those decisions. And we have a concept called stare 
decides this, which says that those decisions are precedent. And unless a judge can distinguish a case from previous cases, that they are obligated to apply the rules and laws that came out of the previous cases. So the legal actors, we have the legislat legislative actors who make laws, and on legislatively we have federal. And while we're, we are not going to deal much with tribal in the context of black health, but tribal uh, tribes have sovereignty and have the right to make laws for their tribes to enforce the law for their tribes, and they have courts that interpret the laws for their tribes. And you should just be aware of that. Um, and so the legislative, legislative make laws, the executive enforce laws, and the agencies operating under the president, the governor, the mayor. And what that, is, what that means is that Police and prisons, in my mind, are legal actors uh, because they operate under the agencies. And other agencies, like Health and Human Services, are legal actors. And then you have the court that makes and interprets law. So how is the law a pathway? Uh, how is the law uh, something that affects the social determinant of health? First of all, the law is a pathway along which broader social determinants of health have an effect. And I apologize for this slide uh, uh, being uh, overlapping. What this means is that social determinants um, are interpreted through the legal system, and that interpretation affects health outcomes. Okay. Uh, this means that the law acts as a pathway, and because it acts as a pathway, it contributes to health inequity because it perpetuates social patterns of inequity, such as uh, racial status. So uh, we have experiences that are both negative or po positives are unevenly distributed through the society and those experiences have psychosocial health effects. The fact is is that African Americans experience racism in a way that whites do not experience it if they experience it at all. And that racism has a psychosocial health effect. And the law is a pathway through which that racism is being experienced. One of the things that uh, Professor Kathy Sanders said, uh, Sanders Phillips said, is that racism and the effects of racism is a stressor that gets under the skin. The law can also be a way uh, through which exposure to, that individuals and communities are exposed to pathogens or pathogenic practices, and those exposures are unevenly distributed. One of the things we know is that the location of toxic waste, toxic dumps, are disproportionately housed in black communities. That is, the EPA has done studies that have shown that the number one factor affecting where a toxic dump would be placed is not the class of the community i.e. poor, but the race of the community. So what we see here is that uh, 
certain social conditions structure health by influencing where people live and what they experience. How the, the normal path day-to-day -day operation of the legal system effectu effective, effectuates the sorting of people into better and poor health because of the experiences they have. The law acts also acts as a shaper of social determinants. Uh, the law influences access to resources. And so what we have is the law provides for tax codes that maintain social economic inequalities, which determines health. Uh, the law creates institutions and procedures for governance um, and, for instance, uh, the electoral law. So we know, for instance, that socially isolated groups, politically isolated groups, have worse health than those who have political power. And we know that the law by the way it allows people to vote or not vote, maintains that social political construction and influence, and therefore influence health. Another way the law works is by constructing the normative world uh, in which people live. The law shapes racism. And race through anti-discrimination law, the law shapes racism and thus influence health. Asking how the law contributes to the creation, maintenance, and reproduction of social status and power offers a way to identify a role, uh, the role of law in health. So what we see is that the law as both as, acts as a pathway uh, to for social determinants to affect health, the green line and acts as a shaper of that social determinant which affects health. The premier work done on structural analysis has been done by Professor Scott per, uh, Burris, who looked at law as a social structure, as a structural factor in the spread of communicable disease. And in that look, he identified essentially four roles of law that I want to talk about. The first role is the law, the law governs and protects the possession and the transfer of wealth. We know that wealth affects health. And we know that the law protects those that have wealth more so than it protects those with does not. And you can look at the tax code, you can look at property laws, you can look at internet trade rules, all point to the protection of wealth in our society. And we will take a look at that this, um, this year. The law also endows or fails to endow individuals with rights that equip them to avoid disease and illness. We know that having human rights are in, important to providing social conditions in which uh, 
people can be healthy, the right to uh, have uh, education, the right to health care, the right to uh, good housing, uh, all of those, the free access to information, all of those influence health. And the law either endows people with those rights or fails to do so. The law regulates the meaning of identities and behavior, categorizing some as favored and others as disfavored. Thus, what we see is law operates to create and preserve social relations and status of power, not through not simply through the regulation of behavior, but the regulation of social meaning. Finally, the law provides settings, legislative bureaucracy and courts in which important social issues are debated and a vocabulary for debating them. I propose to you that the problem with so racism and social determinants is, is that we have not had adequate forum in the 21st century to debate uh, the issues 